A warm welcome, dear friends of protection control and electrical engineering. Today's video is finally about distance protection again. We are responding to an important question from a training participant to our electrical engineering academy and also to the fact that we have a yeah, an very big issue with this topic. It's, it's very important. Today's question is, why is there a load cutout in distance protection? What is it about and how is it calculated? By the way, today's video is sponsored by nobody. As always, let's start with the question why. Why is there a load cutout in distance protection? The figure shows the typical load scenario in a meshed network in Rx diagram. In the first and the fourth quadrant on our right side in the picture, we see the load in the forward direction. And in the second and third quadrant, we see the load of the backward direction. To keep it simple, in the following, we only focus on the forward direction and ignore the load in backward direction. So, what do we notice when we look at the Rx characteristic of the load in the forward direction? We can see that the load area consists of mostly resistive parts that it intersects the R-axis and accordingly can have both a positive X and a negative X. This means nothing more that then our load is based on a large extent on active power flow and can also be either inductive or capacitive. Our load vector will now be somewhere in this area marked in red. As long as we are in a fault-free operating state we will not leave it. In order to be able to describe the limit ranges of this load impedance, which is important for distance protection, we start with two simple network parameters. First, there is the amount of the smallest load impedance, which forms the lower left limit of our load. Now we can see where this limit runs and everything that now passes below this limit can no longer be described as an error-free operating point. The second variable is the maximum load impedance angle that occurs at full load, which tells us how far our phaser turns in the direction of the reactance axis. And with these two variables, or with the smallest load impedance and the largest load impedance angle, we can now nail down the limits of our load range and describe them with sufficient accuracy. In the following step, we now want to look at what the impedance jump looks like in the event of a short circuit. To do this, we first draw an idealized overhead line in our Rx diagram. You can now see the impedance vector of our power line, which could of course also be a high voltage cable, but the vector would not be aligned quite so steeply in the direction to the x-axis, since the x to r ratio of typical cable networks is smaller than that of overhead lines. We now see the electrical footprint of our electrical protected object in our diagram. Let's now start from a slightly inductive operating point in the load area. You can see it as a point here. In case of a short circuit, this point will jump on the vector of the power line. Well, in practice, it's not as simple as we have shown here, because we still have to take into account an unknown ohmic component for the resistance of the electric arc. Or let's think of our face-to-earth loops, where the zero-sequence system must also be taken into account. For our short circuit vector, this means that it will be shifted to the right by an initially unknown ohmic component. And that brings us to our last component, the distance polygon. For our consideration today, it is 
irrelevant whether this is a pickup or a tripping polygon. It is important for us that we realize that the short circuit is within the polygon. And that's precisely the job of a polygon. It should be able to reliably distinguish between a load vector and a short circuit vector. In earlier generations of protection engineering we still had to work with circles and ellipses, also the ellipses were nothing more than circles combined with one another. Today we found ourselves in a comfortable situation with digital distance protection. We can customize the distance polygon to our specific needs and get optimal results. And that brings us to the answer of our first question. The cutout of the load or the hiding of the load area from the picking or tripping area of a polygon serves to improve the reliable distinction between normal operation on the one hand and a fault operation on the other hand. Because with particularly long power lines that are very heavily loaded, there is a high risk that the positive sequence impedance will reach into the tripping area of our polygon in a fault-free state and the device will overfunction as a result of overload and will pick up or trip incorrectly. However, because we inform the relay of the system specific load characteristic, taking the worst case into account, this can be safely separated from the tripping area. It is important to know that the section of the load characteristic for the face-to-face -face pickups and the face-to-earth pickups can usually be activated and parameterized separately. Um, yeah, and this brings us to the next question. Does it even make sense to set a load cutout for the face to earth loops? Well, the fact is that the load basically contains no zero sequence current. Uh, so the load consists of a positive sequence system and if it's not completely symmetrical, it may have a negative system. A zero component on the other hand is impossible. The zero sequence system only appears in the event of a fault with ground contact. But guess what? In practice, the load cutout is activated for the face to earth or face to ground loops as well. The reason for this? In the event of a single phase tripping of neighboring lines, zero sequence systems can be coupled. It is now important here that we have also activated the load cut for the face to earth loops. How can we now calculate the two parameters to determine the amount and the angle for the load section? Well, let's do an example. Let's assume that we have the following primary system. We got the 110 kV overhead line with a cross section of 300. The maximum apparent power that can be transmitted should be about 200 MVA and the minimum operating voltage is 90% of the nominal voltage. We have a 1.2 kilo amps to 5 amps CT ratio and our voltage transformer has a ratio from 110 kV to 100 volt. All we have to do now is to calculate the smallest load impedance and the largest load impedance angle, add a small safely factor to each and convert the results to the secondary side. Okay, let's get started. The amount of the smallest primary load impedance is calculated easy from the quotient of minimum operating voltage and the maximum operating current that can be transmitted. For our example, we get a volume of 54.4 ohm. Now we convert the primary impedance to the secondary side by multiplying the quotient of the current transformer ratio and the voltage transformer ratio by the primary impedance and a safety factor of 0.9. As a result, we get a final setting volume of 10.7 ohm. 
We set the angle of the load cutout and the volume increase by 5 degrees from the maximum occurring load angle or accordingly to the minimum power factor. For example, if we assume a minimum cosinus phi of 0.75, then the angle to be set is calculated from the arc cosine of 0.75 plus a safely margin of another 5 degrees and results in 46.4 degrees. We can now either set these two values directly or adapt them to the vendor specific setting parameters and the load cutout is perfect. It is also important to know if we have a double line with zero sequence coupling, the cards are reshuffled again and somewhat more complex setting specifications apply. And that's it for today. Warm wishes, good luck and see you soon.